When I first saw the reenactment of Copper Sun that the children of Africa had done, it really touched me. The reason was because the children in Africa aren't taught history the same way the children in America are taught history. And they didn't really know about the history of their loss, the history of what happened to the people that had been taken from Africa and brought to this country. So that chapter that deals with Amari's capture and enslavement and the loss and the grief that she felt was acted out by these young people who for the very first time got to see what it was like and feel what it was like to be taken away from their homeland. It was very, very powerful. Copper Sun is a story of a young girl named Amari, who's 15 years old, who's taken from her home and is sold as a slave. In spite of the heat, Amari trembled. The buyers of slaves had arrived. She and the other women were stripped naked. Amari bit her lip, determined not to cry, but she couldn't stop herself from screaming out as her arms were wrenched behind her back and tied. A searing pain shot up through her shoulders. A white man clapped shackles on her ankles, rubbing his hands up her legs as he did. Amari tensed and tried to jerk away, but the chains were too tight. She could not hold back the tears. It was the summer of her 15th year, and this day she wanted to die. Amari shuffled in the dirt as she was led into the yard and up onto a raised wooden table, which she realized gave the people in the yard a perfect view of the women who were to be sold. She looked at the faces in the sea of pink-skinned people who stood around pointing at the captives and jabbering in their language as each of the slaves was described. She looked for pity or even understanding, but found nothing but cool stares. They looked at her as if she were a cow for sale. She saw a few white women fanning themselves and whispering in the ears of well-dressed men, their husbands, she supposed. Most of the people in the crowd were men. However, she did see a poorly dressed white girl about her own age standing near a wagon. The girl had a sullen look on her face and she seemed to be the only person not interested in what was going on at the slave sale. Amari looked up at a seabird flying above and remembered her little brother. I wish he could have flown that night, she thought sadly. I wish I could have flown away as well. This is Sharon Draper, a ruggedly realistic advocate for reading. Drug addiction, child abuse, sexual molestation, racism and discrimination, underage drinking, gang violence, incest, school shootings, death. These are not the words that typically come to mind when one thinks of a young adult children's book. These are not themes that the average parent or teacher expects a teenager to be reading about. And yet, this is Sharon Draper's calling. It is what she writes about, what she forces people to think about, and what she has perfected. The perfect genre of realistic fiction for underprivileged teens. As taboo as her works appear to be, they are highly received by modern teachers and students alike. Her books foster engagement while introducing students to a range of interwoven genres and fluid writing styles. Her books reflect the lives and struggles of many impoverished minority students and even reflect issues faced by students who don't fit into either of those categories. Sharon Draper is a compelling author who knows her audience well and writes to them and for them in a way that incites a non-reading student to pick up a book and refuse to put it down. This is the documentary of Sharon Draper, a well-established author of both children and young adult literature. As a public school English teacher in Cincinnati, Ohio for 30 years, Draper received the myriad of excellence and leadership awards throughout her career in education, including being honored as Ohio's Teacher of the Year, the Ohio Pioneer in Education, and most notably, named the National Teacher of the Year by President Clinton in 1997. While Draper has definitely been acknowledged for her strong contributions to the field of education, that is not at all intruded upon her earning a plethora of merits for her literary talents as well. 
Among these literary merits, Sharon Draper is a five-time winner of the Coretta Scott King Literary Award and has been awarded two Lifetime Achievement Awards between 2011 and 2015. She has also been honored at the White House an astonishing six times. Ironically, Sharon Draper never really aspired to become a published writer. In fact, she actually composed her first work of fiction when she was challenged by one of her students to enter into a local writing contest. Needless to say, she won first place and immediately noticed her potential for literary success. In 1994, she released her first book, a children's book titled Ziggy and the Black Dinosaurs. From that point on, Draper continued to hone in on her skill of writing and produce a range of written works, including pieces of nonfiction and poetry. And through these writings, it became clear that Sharon Draper knows exactly what children and teenagers yearn to read about. As she stated in her 2007 interview with teachingbooks.net, I used to have a big sign in my classroom that said, the B word is not allowed in here. I will not allow you to be bored. Similarly, I won't allow me to be boring. So there was always action and energy in my classroom. Sharon Draper has authored many texts, primarily in the areas of children's literature and young adult literature. She began her writing career as a children's book author, and she focused on two primary characters, Ziggy and Sassy. Ziggy and the Black Dinosaurs. Sharon Draper originated a series titled Ziggy and the Black Dinosaurs, which follows four African-American boys who make up the Black Dinosaurs Club. Each story in this six book series combines folklore, history, and fiction while journeying with the four main characters through adventures and mysteries of everyday life. The Sassy Series. Sharon Draper also composed a children's chapter book series about a nine-year-old African-American girl named Sassy. The Sassy Series illustrates coming-of-age issues and provides realistic fiction for children who may be soon transitioning to young adult literature. While her children's book have earned her a lot of prestige, Draper's young adult literature is arguably her most prolific work. In most literary circles, it is what she is best known for. She has produced a wide variety of critically acclaimed young adult literature, including the following titles. Copper Sun, Double Dutch, November Blues, Romeo and Julio, Just Another Hero, and her infamous Hazelwood High trilogy, Tears of a Tiger, Forged by Fire, and darkness before dawn. Take a listen to this brief reading from her first piece of fiction, which later became the first chapter to one of her most popular young adult novels, Forged by Fire. I'm gonna read an excerpt from chapter one of Forged by Fire. If you don't sit your stinking useless butt back down in that shopping cart, I swear I'll bust your greasy face in, she screamed at the three-year-old in front of her. He studied her face, decided she was serious, and put his leg back inside the cart. He was standing near the front end of the cart amidst an assorted pile of cigarette boxes, egg cartons, and pop bottles. He didn't want to sit down anyway because of the soft, uncomfortable load in his pants, which had been there all afternoon and which felt cold and squishy when he moved too much. He rarely had accidents like that, but when he did, Mama sometimes made him keep it in his pants all day to teach him a lesson. Gerald was only three but he had learned many such lessons. He had never seen Sesame Street, never heard of Riverfront Stadium. He didn't even know he lived in Cincinnati, but he knew the important things, like never mess with mama when she was in bed. Mama got really mad when you woke her up and never touched that hot thing that mama used to light her cigarettes, even if the mysterious orange and blue fire that comes out of it liked to tease you and dance for only a moment before running away. Mama had once caught Gerald playing with the lighter and she made the fire come out and she held his hand right over the flame. It wasn't his friendly fire dancer though, but a cruel red soldier that made his hand scream and made him dizzy with pain. And he could smell something like the meat mama cooked, but it was his hand. When she stopped, she'd washed his hand with cool water and soothed him with warm hugs and wrapped with salve and bandages the place where the fire soldier had stabbed him. She told him she had done it for his own good and to teach him a lesson. 
He had tried to tell her he was just trying to find the fire dancer, but she wasn't listening and he had given up, thankful for the hugs and the silence. Sharon Draper's texts are undoubtedly stimulating. Still, with such loaded works and explicit themes, Sharon Draper sometimes receives mixed reviews. For example, when it comes to Draper's Forged by Fire, Amazon.com Brook critic Gail Hudson states, Sharon Draper has indeed forged a fiery name for herself in the field of young adult literature, that of a courageous writer willing to tackle tough real life problems while developing honorable streetwise role models for troubled teens. Unfortunately, Draper's strengths, her desire to delve into tough social issues such as child abuse, drug addiction, incest, bulimia, and domestic violence become this book's weakness as the storyline teeters on implausible. While the themes in Forged by Fire may seem implausible for some, for many low socioeconomic minority students, this storyline illustrates a range of themes and incidents that reflect their reality. The issues that Sharon Draper focuses on in her text are issues that are faced by many less fortunate teenagers. Within poverty-stricken neighborhoods, drug and alcohol abuse, domestic violence, mass incarceration and gang violence are all prevalent. And Sharon Draper is well aware. As Sharon Draper stated in her interview with teachingbooks.net, I try to make sure the characters are balanced and reflect what young people might do in a particular situation so that readers see something of themselves in my characters. I have learned that kids have to handle issues that their parents either are afraid to admit exist or don't want to talk about. So I give young people the opportunity to talk about them. I write about fictional characters that have problems. Take, for example, the girl who is going out with a boy who's way too old for her or kids who live in an abusive home. One little girl wrote to me and said, I read your book. I called that toll-free number in the back of the book for the National Child Abuse Hotline, and you saved my life. Another little girl said, I was at a party, and my friends were drinking, and I had started reading your book. I called my mom and asked her to come pick me up. My friends were in an accident that night. So you saved my life. I personally enjoy Sharon Draper's literature because I've seen the power it has to inspire students who hate reading to actually read a novel from beginning to end. Her young adult books attract struggling non-readers in a way that most books don't, while still maintaining literary merit. These novels have the astonishing ability to appeal to a range of students, but especially those minority students who can directly relate to the targeted themes. In my classroom, Students have not only appreciated reading her novel Forged by Fire as a class, but they also took it upon themselves to find the rest of the Hazelwood High trilogy to read independently. These novels promote reading for even the most unexpected of readers. And as a language arts teacher and lover of literature, what more could I or anyone else ask for? Moreover, Draper's books open up classes to tough but important discussions that need to be had. Like Draper said, The matters she writes about are taboo issues that no one wants to discuss. Yet her literature transcends simply creating a fictional story and instead opens up the eyes of all readers to the real pains that exist in households across the nation. Her literature tends to be a window into the impoverished teen's reality. It is important that students who relate know that they are not alone. It is equally important that students who don't relate realize that these are real issues that many of their peers are dealing with. Her books incite even the quietest students to talk about the situations posed in the text while analyzing the characters in their development. 
It's the perfect blend of entertainment and literary analysis that proves to be an effective stepping stone to scaffold struggling students to more difficult and traditional academic texts. Her books have the ability to create a strong foundation for successful and efficient readers of the future. I'm going to read an excerpt from November Blues. The bus rumbled to her stop and November sat down in the first empty seat. She closed her eyes and thought back to the grainy image on the sonogram. When are you due? A young voice said, interrupting November's thoughts. Startled, November looked over. A very pregnant girl was sitting next to her. Uh, I got about four more months. How about you? Oh, the doctor at the clinic says any day now. The girl wore a very tight, hot pink t-shirt stretched over her huge belly and matching pink flip-flops covered with tiny pink daisies. Shiny, several sparkled eyeshadow decorated her eyelids, and she wore her blonde hair brushed back into two long braids. The kid looks like a baby herself, November thought. How old are you, November asked. I'm 12. 12? You're in middle school. She was the same age as Jericho's kid brother. November gulped. How did you, how did you, November pointed at the girl's bulging tummy. How did you, I mean, you're uh, 12. How did I get pregnant? Same way you did, the girl said casually. But you're just a kid. Shouldn't you be playing with Barbies or something? I know I'm young, but I'm very mature for my age, the girl replied. Her fingernails were painted bright green. She dug in her purse, which was decorated with Disney princesses, pulled out a pack of Jolly Rancher candy and popped two in her mouth. Want one, she said. No, thanks. My doctor doesn't want me eating a lot of sugar. Didn't your doctor say something about that? The girl rolled her eyes. You sound like my mother. Give me a break. Sharon Draper is an amazing author who has used her celebrity and her gift of writing to shine a light on everyday issues that most don't care to discuss in a way that has attracted students who are normally unattracted to literature. She has managed to create an assortment of written works with a variety of themes most relatable to children and teenagers, from the simplicities of falling in love to the complexities of abuse and negligence. For this reason, Sharon Draper's literature should be in every classroom library, for it is the educator's responsibility to promote a differentiated learning and reading environment. In short, students should have access to literature that relates to them, engages them, guides them, and transports them. Sharon Draper and her vividly realistic fiction give our youth the desire to pick up a book and not put it down until the very last page. Sharon Draper epitomizes what it is to be a supporter of literature through her contribution through teaching and authoring books. She is engaging. She's real. She is raw. She is talented. Sharon Draper embodies what it means to be a ruggedly realistic advocate for reading. I'm Tiffany Gordon, and thank you for listening. Good night. Sharon M. Draper, D-R-A-P-E-R. I'm an educator. I'm an author. I'm a public speaker. I taught middle school and high school for 20 years. I was named National Teacher of the Year a few years back. I got to travel all over the world because of that. I've been to the White House seven times, not just visiting, but I've been honored at the White House many, many times. I'm an author of, I just finished my 30th book, and um, my books are required reading in schools all over the country, middle schools and high schools all over the country. Um, I have been... Um, I've been blessed to receive many, many, many awards, literary awards, public awards, public service awards. It has just been a wonderful ride.